The Greek debt crisis hit with a bang in 2012 when the Greek government experienced the largest sovereign debt default in history. In 2015, its government debt had reached 323 billion euros and Greece became the first developed country to fail to make an IMF loan repayment. The roots of the crisis were connected to the 2001 introduction of the euro as a common currency, a move which initially had positive results, re uh, reducing trade costs among the eurozone countries and leading to an increase in the volume of trade. Over time, however, labor costs increased more in Greece and Europe's other peripheral countries relative to the same costs in eurozone countries like Germany, making Greek exports less competitive, and as a result, Greek saw its trade deficit rise sharply. A trade deficit compels governments either to borrow from other countries or to devalue their own currencies or both. By virtue of being a member of the European Monetary Union and using the euro as a, its currency, however, Greece could not devalue its currency. Syriza, a left-wing party, was voted into office in early 2015 on a platform of resisting neoliberalism. But because it was determined to stay in the European Union, Syriza was unable to devalue its currency as part of an overall response to the crisis. This left the quest for loans on onerous terms as the only response available to the government. With the onset of the 2008 economic crisis, bankers in Berlin, London, and Wall Street strove to convince Greeks and the rest of the world that Greece's problems were caused by Greeks living beyond their means due to their profligate social spending. Ignoring the combined impacts of the global crisis, massive arms purchases by the Greek government, and the, Greek, uh, the government's inability to devalue its currency, the bankers insisted that the necessary response to the crisis lay in the application of stringent austerity. How large were these arms purchases that I just mentioned? In 2010, no less authority than the Wall Street Journal reported that, quote, Greece, with a population of just 11 million, is the largest importer of conventional weapons in Europe and ranks fifth in the world behind China, India, the United Arab Emirates, and South Korea. Its military spending is the highest in the European Union as a percentage of gross domestic product. That spending was one of the factors behind Greece's stratospheric national debt. That's the Wall Street Journal. As a proportion of GDP, Greece spends twice as much as any other EU member on military weaponry. Ironically, the very forces that were determined to discipline uh, Greece for its profligate social spending simultaneously encouraged the country to engage in even more arms purchases. According to Dimitris Papadimoulis, a Syriza member of the European Parliament, Germany and France were trying to seal lucrative weapons deals with Greece at the very same time they were pushing the country to make deep cuts in health and social spending. After 2010, successive austerity packages were inflicted on Greece, dictated by Germany and France, whose banks were most at risk from a Greek default. These packages were implemented by a set of institutions known collectively as the Troika, comprised of the European Commission, the European Central Bank, and the IMF, International Monetary Fund. After five years of mass unemployment and social spending cuts, Greek debt hadn't decreased. In fact, it had increased significantly. It was under these circumstances that the government of Greece and the Troika institutions signed a memorandum of understanding on August 14th, 2015. The terms of the MOU give these institutions and Europe's bankers direct control over the Greek economy in exchange for a $98 billion loan, an amount that uh, will be added to Greece's already unpayable debt and raise the country's total debt to more than 400 billion euros. Nearly all the 98 billion euros is earmarked for debt payments and for the recapitalization of Greek banks. In order to satisfy the loan terms, Greeks will be compelled to produce more, reduce social spending, and raise taxes in order to make the interest payments on their ever-rising debt. The Memorandum of Understanding describes the nature of the Troika's role in managing Greeks, uh, Greece's finances, as well as how the wealth will be extracted and transferred. The MOU explicitly states that no legislation or other action by Greece's political institutions can be taken without prior approval of the Troika, hearkening to the comments that Roger just made about the uh, end of sovereignty. 
In other words, the Troika has veto power over virtually all policy measures and all legislative or executive decisions by all levels of government in Greece. The Troika will define the country's budget priorities and will oversee the actual writing of the budget. The MOU lays out a plan for the total restructuring of Greek taxes and government spending. Finally, representatives of the Troika will monitor compliance to ensure that Greece adheres strictly to these terms and conditions. The MOU stipulates that the Troika will have the power to appoint, quote unquote, independent consultants to the board of, boards of Greek banks to manage them on a day-to-day -day basis. Under the terms of the MOU, the World Bank will redesign the Greek welfare system and create a new stripped-down social safety net. Troika-approved appointees will run the labor ministry and, quote unquote, rationalize the education system, i.e. carry out layoffs of teachers and administer wage cuts. The new labor minister, vetted by the Troika, will implement proposals coming from consultants provided by the Troika to limit strikes, oversee collective bargaining, and institute new rules governing layoffs. Pensions will be cut. The retirement age will be raised. Workers' health care contributions will be increased. Local governments will be made more efficient via layoffs and wage cuts. And the country's entire legal system will be overhauled. An institution known as the Privatization of Greek Government Assets Fund will operate under the supervision of the relevant European institutions, enabling the Troika to decide what is to be privatized and sold at fire sale prices to which favored investors. East Germany, 1990, Greece, 2015. In the context of this discussion, it is revealing to look at two events that took place exactly 25 years apart, the first on July 1st, 1990 in Berlin, and the second on July 1st, 2015 in Athens. One man, Wolfgang Schäuble, played a central role in both events. Schäuble was West Germany's interior ministry, minister in 18, excuse me, 1989-1990 when East Germany, the GDR, was united with West Germany. Four months after the Berlin Wall came down, Schäuble produced an 800-page unification treaty. Its first step involved switching East Germany's currency to the West German mark. It was in 1990 that a new institution called the Privatization Fund, or Treuhand, was set up. The Treuhand was the model for what the same Mr. Schäuble, currently serving as Minister of Finance under Chancellor Angela Merkel and key player in European Troika, has recently forced down the throats of the Greek people. In East Germany, the effects of the fund hit like a bomb. East German products were rendered almost unavailable as those produced in the West overwhelmed the region's economy. In order to guarantee that shares in nationally owned East German industries would not be divided up equitably among the people of East Germany, who were, after all, their putative owners, the privatization fund made sure that the industries were either sold to private owners or shut down altogether. Within months, the lights had been turned off in a third of the East German economy. West German competitors and outside speculators bought factories for a song made a quick buck, removed machinery they thought worth selling, and then shut them down. In January 1990, East German industry had been calculated to be worth 1.2 trillion marks. In September, the privatization fund deemed these same assets valued to be worth half that much, 600 billion. By the time the fund closed down in 1994, the value of these assets had plunged to minus 250 billion marks. Within 20 months of unification, 3,700 East German plants were shuttered and their workforces slashed from 4.1 million to 1.24 million. Unemployment soared. The region's kindergartens, libraries, music, hobby and sports clubs, well-staffed medical clinics and seaside or lakeside vacation homes deemed to be unproductive by the engineers of unification disappeared. 25 years later, East Germany is still well behind East, uh, West Germany in full-time employment, wages, and pensions. Many towns and entire regions remain economically barren with young people eager to move to the West in search of jobs. Schäuble and Germany's financiers were delighted with their work. The attempt to build socialism with some significant successes despite its many blunders had been throttled, enabling ThyssenKrupp, Siemens, Bayer, 
BASF and the Deutsche Bank to move back to the east, where they had been ejected 45 years earlier. At the same time, the European Union, whose earliest founders included OSS chief William Donovan, CIA boss Alan Dulles, West German Chancellor uh, Konrad Adenauer, and Winston Churchill achieved their long-term uh, long goal, described by Churchill earlier with the phrase, the liberation of the nations behind the Iron Curtain. It was clear from the start that Schäuble wanted not compromise, but Syriza's total capitulation. Ideally, it's removal from office. Statements made by the International Monetary Fund to the effect that it was impossible to resolve the Greek debt crisis through severe austerity measures were therefore ignored. Ultimately, this confrontation brought Schäuble and his allies a brutal victory over forces attempting to find independent policies designed to address the needs not of Europe's giant banks, but those of the Greek people. In carrying out his crusade, Schäuble was helped by the head of the Eurogroup, right-wing Dutch Social Democrat, Jorin Disselbloom, the staunchly conservative European Council President Donald Tusk from Poland, and Jean-Claude Juncker, President of the European Commission, who earlier served as Finance Minister and then Prime Minister of Luxembourg from 1989 to 2013, a period when 243 companies, including IKEA, Deutsche Bank and Pepsi benefited from secret tax deals that enabled them to pay sharply reduced taxes on their global profits. Aided by such men, supported by arch-conservative governments in Eastern and Northern Europe, with the governments of Italy, Spain, and Portugal kowtowing to Schäuble for fear that a party like Syriza might pose a threat to their own rule, and with France succumbing to Angela Merkel's pressure, the threat of Greece was contained. Greece must now raise value-added tax in poverty-stricken Greek communities, cut pension benefits, slice government jobs, and make further cuts to social services. These Spartan measures will mean more hunger, untreated illness, emigration of youth, and suicide for many of the elderly forced on Greece by the Troika and endorsed by its parliament. A new institution, the Hellenic Republic Asset Development Fund, which is a reborn version of Schäuble's German Privatization Fund, or Troihand, will organize the sale of everything the Greek state owns. Its international airports, seaports, the Olympic site, the rail system, and utilities. Such privatizations con uh, constitute an all-out retreat from the steps that were taken toward building an economy that was not being totally ruined and ruled by big business and the country's oligarchs. Potential buyers, keenly aware of the terms and conditions to be administered by the fund, understand that the Greek government is being compelled to sell these assets. They are consequently in a position to offer as little as possible. This bargain basement sale of property owned by the Greek state recalls events in East Germany after 1990. It is not designed to help Greece recover economically, but rather to serve as a dire warning to other countries never to undertake similar efforts. In the course of this crisis, the true character of the European Union has become unmistakably clear. Unfortunately, rather than attempting to explain any of this to the public, the media has helped the banks, financiers, and oligarchs to wage a campaign depicting Greeks as lazy, spoiled bums who are trying to dodge payments on debts generated by their profligate, profligate behavior and therefore undeserving of our sympathies. The only hope that exists in this situation is that the Greek uh, people will push back against this anti-human strategy. Recent events in Greece offer a glimmer of encouragement along these lines. A general strike was called there this week to protest against the EU's neoliberal agenda and to demand substantive change. The strike seems to have enjoyed widespread popular support, but such protests clearly won't be sufficient as a response to the neoliberal assault. By way of preparation for what will be necessary in Greece and beyond, I would echo the view of Andreas Karitsis, a former member of the Central Committee of Syriza. He argues that it is necessary for the left to reformulate its fundamental views on contemporary society and the limits of formal democracy in the context of rampaging neoliberalism. It isn't possible for me to lay out Karitsis' argument here. I can only urge you to access his article entitled The Dilemmas and Potentials of the Left, Learning from Syriza, which was circulated on the bullet, the listserv run by the Socialist Project. Thank you. Thank you.